Uh, all right, so yeah, it's my pleasure to have uh, Rustam Sadikov from uh, Kansas, and he will talk about topological solutions of differential relations. So uh, please take it away. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, I will be talking today about topological methods, topological solutions of differential uh, relations. Uh, and uh, uh, I will begin with the H principle which is the homotopy principle. And then I will show uh, how it leads to the B principle or Borgism principle. So, so the H principle uh, is an observation that problems in differential geometry can often be reduced to problems in homotopy theory. And the point here is that problems in differential geometry usually are hard to solve, while problems in homotopy theory are easier to solve because of homotopy theoretic methods. So for example, let's consider an open manifold M, and then we can consider the following three problems. So first, does the manifold M admit a symplectic context structure, or does M admit affiliation of a given codimension? or does M admit a metric of negative scalar curvature? So these are differential geometry problems. However, when an open manifold M, they all reduce to homotopy theory. And in general, the H principle has been formalized and uh, it has been shown that uh, it is often true. Uh, there are many people who contributed to the development of the H principle but the general formalization uh, and a general proof is uh, due to Gromov. Similarly, the B principle or Bordism principle, uh, it is a version of the homotopy principle and it is an observation that problems in differential geometry can often be reduced to problems in stable homotopy theory. Uh, there are several instances uh, remarkable instances uh, that are known. These are standard Mumford conjecture on modular spaces, uh, barrett Predi and Quillian theorem, and say Eliasberg theorem on Legendrian immersions. Uh, and I propose a formalization of the B principle and I prove that it is often, often true. Of course, there are many examples of the B principle, known examples of the B principle, and many people shown in different situations that uh, B principle type statements uh, are correct, are uh, true. So I will, as I said, I will start with the uh, H principle. And the approach that I like the most is um, using uh, holonomic approximation theorem. Holonomic approximation theorem is a very surprising theorem due to Eliasberg and Mishachov. Uh, to motivate the theorem, let's consider arbitrary three functions, f0, f1, f2, and these functions may not be even smooth. So these are just continuous functions on a plane, on R2. The questions that we are interested in here is, does there exist a function f such that f approximates f0 and uh, the derivatives of f approximate f1 and f2. So basically, um, is it true that for any epsilon, we can find a function f such that this triple of functions is epsilon close to this triple of functions? The answer to this uh, question is quite obvious. The answer is no. Uh, we cannot get such an approximation sometimes. For example, uh, suppose that the function f0 is the function x1. So here on R2, I use coordinates x1 and x2. And so the function f0 is the function that increases in the x1 direction. And uh, let us put f1 to be negative one and f2 to be zero. So in other words, we are looking for function f that is very close to the function x1 and such that uh, in the direction x1, uh, its derivative is negative one, and in direction x2, its der derivative is zero. And clearly such function does not exist because you see if the function f0 is close to x1, then on average uh, it's increasing and it's 
rate of increase is one. Uh, so its derivative cannot be always close to uh, negative one. And in fact, uh, what is important for me is that there is no approximation of this triple of functions by a function f together with its two derivatives, even near this interval i. So this is an important interval for me. Uh, I will be referring to this interval many times. So let, let's just remember that there is this interval i, which is an interval, uh, unit interval in the x1 direction. Uh, so this is this interval over here. Uh, by the way, can you see my the mouse that I'm using as a pointer? Uh, yes, it's okay. Okay, very good. So, uh, so there is this interval i over here, and uh, there exists no approximation even in the neighborhood of this interval i. Okay, so this is like an easy question, and uh, it seems boring, but let's consider now a slightly different question. So again, we have three functions, f0, f1, f2 on a plane. And now I'm asking about the existence of two things. So first, I'm uh, asking about the existence of a small diffeomorphism from R2 to itself. Uh, this diffeomorphism is a displacing diffeomorphism. It displaces the interval i, which I was just mentioning on the previous slide. So this is, recall that this interval i is the unit interval in the x1 direction. And if you apply this diffeomorphism h, then it displaces the interval i to this uh, green curve, right? So this is slightly displaced. Uh, and so the question is, does it do, do there exist this small diffeomorphism and a function again f, such that f together with its two derivatives approximate f0, f1, f2, but near the displacement, hi. So we know that such an approximation does not exist over a neighborhood of i, but now the question is, uh, can we do approximation near a displacement? And it seems that this question is totally, the, uh, totally similar to the previous question, and you may even suspect that the answer is no. But a surprising thing is that the answer to this question is yes. So indeed, uh, there exists a displacement uh, h, a displacing diffeomorphism h, and a function f such that f together with its two derivatives approximate f0, f1, f2. And I'm going to construct it. So first of all, I will need to construct a displacing diffeomorphism, and then I will be constructing this approximating function. So to define the displacement, I will just use the sine function. Uh, and you can see that over here I have two parameters. I have the parameter delta and the parameter n capital. n capital should be very large, and it just means that uh, this sine function is oscillating very fast. So it has many periods over here. Uh, on the other hand, this delta parameter should be very small. And this parameter delta just allows me to have a very small displacement. Recall that the displacement that we are interested in over here should be C0 small. And if this parameter delta is very small, then the displacement is going to be small. Right? So then uh, the second thing that we need to do is to find a function uh, f such that f together with its two derivatives, uh, approximately equal to f0, f1, f2. And we need to do this near the displaced interval i, so near the graph of that sine function. Uh, I will do this in a few steps. So first, I'm going to take this interval i. Uh, so the, the green curve over here is that displaced hi. And I'm, I need to have an approximation in the neighborhood of this hi. So I take this i. And uh, I break this by points aj, which are j divided by 2n. Uh, in particular, this green curve intersects the uh, x-axis at the points like a2, a0, a2, a4, a6, and so on. And uh, these points are odd points, odd indexed points, a1, a3, a5, 
A7 and, and so on. And then uh, I denote by A sub J, this intervals AJ, AJ plus one. So for example, over here, over here, so the first interval is I0, then I have interval A I1, I2, I3, I4, and so on, right? <coughs> Then uh, we find this function uh, just in the neighborhood of even uh, intervals. Intervals that are indexed by even num numbers of the form 2j. And to do that, we just use uh, a Taylor approximation, Taylor formula. So for example, how to uh, get such function f, how to define this function f, over the interval i4. Uh, so the interval i4 is over here. And what we do here is that we say that this point a4 is the point p. And now at the point p, we calculate f0 of, of p, f1 of p, and f2 of p. So recall that these are the functions that we are approximating. And I'm just looking at their values at the point p. And then I use this f0, f1, f2, uh, calculated at p, so these are three numbers, to construct this uh, linear function. And you can see that this linear function, it's over this uh, i to j, it approximates the function, uh, the function f0, f1, f2 uh, very well, right? So indeed for this linear function, uh, it's close to f0 and its derivatives with respect to x1 and x2 are close to f1 of p and f2 of p. And if the, this picture is very small, then we get uh, precisely what we want. And now uh, for the next step, we need to construct an approximation over the odd indexed intervals. And to do this, we, this is slightly subtle, but to do this, we first uh, construct an extension uh, just over the green curve. And over the green curve, it's not difficult uh, to do the construction uh, because most of this green curve is just vertical. And so basically, uh, the, because of that, over most of the curve, the derivative should be uh, close to zero. And here we see that uh, the values at the endpoints of the function are almost the same. And because of, of that, there is no problem to uh, extending the function over this green curve. And then we just extend it uh, in the perpendicular direction. Uh, and this gives us uh, this approximating function f, which is fairly surprising. And uh, if you apply the holonomic approximation theorem, so you can see that you get indeed some paradoxes. Okay, I hope that uh, you get the idea of how to construct this uh, approximating function. Let me just review what we what we proved. So we proved that for any functions f0, f1, f2, we can find a displacing diffeomorphism uh, that displaces the interval i. So it, it makes some kind of sign curve, and then we can find the function f near the sign curve, such that f together with its derivatives uh, is close to f0, f1, and f2. Okay. Um, oh, so I'm unfortunately. Okay, so uh, the holonomic approximation theorem uh, of Eliasberg and Mishachov is a more general statement. So they consider it a cube d, uh, which is uh, a cube negative one one to the m in um, m. Rustam, yes. Uh, if I may interrupt, so yes. Marius <laughs> asked on chat. Maybe Marius, I think it's uh -huh. easiest if you just unmute yourself. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So no, you, you said that it gives some uh, ah, right. paradoxes. Paradox. Yeah. Th you, thank you, you for the question. Of... Yeah, I'm going to talk about this paradoxes. Okay. I'm going to give some examples and I'm going to talk about this paradoxes. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, yes. Uh, and so, uh, Elias Pershkin and Mishachov, they consider this cube, T, right? And they consider it a subcube I. So in our case, this subcube I, it was just the interval. Remember that was the interval in X1 direction, uh, but in general, uh, you just consider a, an S-dimensional subcube, okay? And then uh, the theorem is 
in just this generalization of what we've seen, that given a map from the disk D to Rn, so now this is not just a function, but this is uh, a family of functions, right? Uh, or yeah, a map to Rn. And suppose that we are given uh, formal partial derivatives f1, f2, and so on. Here, uh, I call these functions formal partial derivatives, though these are arbitrary functions and they have no relation to f0, so they are independent. So as in the previous example, we just have function f0, f1, f2, and so on. And I call them formal partial derivatives just because they correspond to partial derivatives of a function of order up to k. And then the claim is that, uh, sorry, that there exists a small displacing diffeomorphism h, so it displaces this blue uh, disk i into something like a generalized sign graph. And then there exists a map f of the neighborhood of the displaced cube, such that f together with its derivatives is approximately f0, f1, f2, and, and so on. And this approximation is uh, in the neighborhood of the displayed cube, right? So just, just as before. Uh, first of all, uh, this eliasberg mishashov theorem uh, is uh, true in its relative and uh, parametric form. Um, so uh, this is a, a holonomic approximation theorem. It's uh, very surprising, uh, at least to me. Uh, and uh, it can be used to, uh, to prove the general H principle of Gromov. So let me formulate the H principle. So the H principle is uh, for differential relations. So a differential relation imposed on the function is a system of differential equations and inequalities. So usually we discuss differential equations. We study uh, differential equations where we have equalities, but uh, a differential relation is something more general. Uh, and the reason is that uh, in geometry, we often have uh, diff not differential equations, but differential relations. So many structures are defined by inequalities rather than equalities. And because of that, it's reasonable uh, for geometrists and topologists to consider differential relations rather than differential equations. And furthermore, we uh, like to consider systems of differential equations and inequalities. <clears throat> but for example, solutions to a differential relation, uh, well, it's just a function that satisfies all these equations and inequalities in the system. So this is a fairly obvious definition. And now uh, the idea behind the H principle is uh, how to solve uh, topologically uh, these differential relations is by means of formal solutions. So what is a formal solution? So I will define the formal solution to a differential equation first. Uh, to this end, let's consider a differential equation. So a differential equation, uh, it's some uh, equation in terms of x1 through xm, uh, the function f and uh, derivatives of f. Not necessarily of the first order, this could be derivatives of arbitrary order. And now uh, a family of functions, f0, f1, f2, and so on, is a formal solution if uh, it basically solves these equations when we plug in uh, f0 for f, f1 for df dx1, f2 for df dx2, and, and so on. Um, if this uh, definition is confusing, it should be clarified by just an example. So let's consider a differential equation. So here I have a uh, fifth order derivative of f minus first order derivative of f minus f equals zero. So this is a linear differential equation of fifth order. And actually I chose the efficient so that uh, it's uh, not solvable in elementary functions. Uh, but then uh, it's very easy to solve it if we solve it formally. To solve it formally, we just need to produce functions f0, f1, f2, and so on, such that f5 equals f1 plus f0. Indeed, if you have uh, this type of functions, then when you plug f0 for f, 
f1 for f prime, and then f5 for, for the fifth derivative, then you get uh, identity. So this is a formal solution. And here, when I solve uh, a differential relation formally or a differential equation formally, I can use any continuous function. So this, uh, these functions f0, f1, and f5 uh, are arbitrary functions. So you can see that uh, differential equations, not only this one, but just more general differential equations, they may, may be hard to solve explicitly, but uh, they are much easier to solve formally. So formally, it's, you don't really need to do much. Uh, this was the definition of a formal solution uh, of a differential equation, but as you may expect, formal solutions to differential relations are defined similarly, except uh, so the only difference is that instead of equality over here, I would consider uh, equalities and inequalities. And instead of just one equation, I, do, I would consider a system of equations. But otherwise, the definition of a formal solution is just the same. And now, uh, with each differential relation, we can associate not only the space of genuine solutions, so these are solutions uh, to a differential relation, but we can also consider the space of formal solutions, right? So formal solutions, again, these are these tuples, right? We consider the space of formal solutions. And uh, of course, uh, solutions, genuine solutions, uh, form a subspace of the space of formal solutions. Indeed, uh, recall that again, that these formal solutions, these are tuples of functions, right? And uh, whenever you have a solution, of course, you can produce this tuple of functions. So you just take f together with its derivatives. And of course, uh, this f together with its derivative, uh, let's back to the, go back to the definition. And of course, if you have this function f uh, together with its derivative, and if you plug f together with its derivative into the equation and you have the identity, then of course, f is a solution, right? And so this way, whenever you have a solution, uh, you can produce this like tuple of functions just by saying that f0 is f, f1 is df dx1, f2 is df dx2, and this way you get a formal solution. So every solution is a formal solution. So the space of genuine solutions is a subspace of formal solutions. So the Gromov H principle asserts, and this may, may be true and may be not true. So this is just a principle. So it asserts that this inclusion is a big homotopy equivalence. So if this is a big homotopy equivalence, then we say that the H principle holds true. <coughs> and uh, surprisingly, in many cases, uh, it is true. Uh, why? So what, what is a weak homotopy equivalence? So weak homotopy equivalence uh, says, uh, means that the topological invariants of this space are the same as topological invariants of this space. So topologically, these spaces are basically the same. Uh, in particular, if you have a solution over here, uh, if you have a formal solution, then you can deform it to a genuine solution. Or if you have here a family of solutions, then you can deform them into a family of genuine solutions. So this is a very strong theorem because you see, uh, for a differential relation, often it's very hard to solve this differential relation. But as for formal relations, uh, as we have seen previously, so you don't need to do so much work to solve them. Uh, and then basically you have this correspondence between solutions and formal solutions. So this is a very strong theorem. So let me show how to uh, prove this, uh, give at least an idea of how to prove uh, a general uh, of H principle. <coughs> so here we will consider uh, differential relations that are invariant with respect to coordinate changes. And uh, I will also assume that the differential relation is actually open. So I don't want differential equations. So everything uh, in the system is going to be just inequalities. Uh, an example of such a differential relation would be over here. Uh, so this is a, an invariant uh, open differential relation. So first of all, it's invariant with respect to coordinate changes because this differential relation, though it's written in some coordinates, 
it does not depend on your choice of coordinates because basically it just says that we are interested in a function with no critical points and uh, if you have a function which has no critical points and in any if you use any coordinate system such an equation would hold true and the second uh, this is an open differential relation because I have strict inequalities, right? Uh, and now the H principle uh, theorem states that actually H principle for maps of open manifolds holds true for any open differential relation invariant with respect to coordinate changes. So this is what I kind of promised that this H principle statement is uh, very often true. Uh, and in fact, differential relations can be imposed uh, not only on functions or maps, but also on tenders and other related structures. By the way, over here, uh, kind of, I should say that, uh, maybe I kind of, I think that I've written here, but uh, so, but I have to state this, that if you have a differential relation, which is uh, invariant with respect to coordinate changes, then such a differential relation can be imposed on maps of manifolds. And the reason is because, well, you can just uh, impose it over coordinate charts. And you know that uh, this differential relation does not uh, depend on your choice of coordinate charts. Uh, examples of these invariant uh, differential relations that are open, uh, basically, um, say, maps with prescribed singularities or immersions of sub or submersions, something like this. <coughs> so differential relation can be imposed on tensors and other related structures. And because of that, uh, this theorem uh, gives H principle for contact symplectic structures on open manifolds, foliations on open manifolds, and positive negative curvature on open manifolds. So how to prove this? Uh, ah, here is an example, and this is actually, it asks your question about uh, uh, like paradoxes. So this is one of the paradoxes. Um, it's, so let's consider, say, for example, uh, two functions on R2 without the origin. Right? So we just uh, remove the or origin from R2, so this point is not uh, in the domain. And now we consider two functions. One function is a uh, absolute value of x and the other function is negative absolute value of x. <clears throat> These two functions have no critical points, meaning that the surfaces of the graphs are nowhere horizontal. So no tangent plane to the surfaces is horizontal. And so the claim is that you can deform uh, one surface to the other uh, through surfaces that are nowhere horizontal. So you, you are allowed to modify this surface like little by little, but uh, you're not allowed to make the surface horizontal at any point. So at any point, the tangent plane should not be horizontal. Okay? And this is possible. So of course, if you try and do, do it in kind of in an obvious way to like avert this, like just push, the inside part up and the outside part to the bottom, then of course, at some point you will have uh, some point where the tangent plane is going to be horizontal. So you cannot do that. But uh, using the H principle, so H principle says that it's possible <coughs> because these are open uh, differential relations. So we consider this open differential relations over an open manifold. Uh, which is R2 minus zero, and so it's, it should be possible. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to give a sketch uh, of the proof of the H principle, and if you just uh, apply that sketch to this picture, then you immediately get uh, this aversion. Not immediately, I mean that you still have to think a little bit, but uh, it is uh, with uh, uh, Eliasberg Mishachov holonomic approximation theorem and with the sketch that I will give, this will be fairly straightforward. Um, Rustam, yes, there's yes. another question uh, from Marius on uh -huh. chat. Uh -huh. And I think yes. he would want like, yeah, are there like, uh, I guess, explicit uh, algorithms that would exactly do this picture, much like there's like explicit uh, kind of depictions of the, the right, right, right. and things like this? Yeah, so actually, 
like I, I do not have a video of this, like uh, the inside, uh, uh, like a version of the sphere, uh, but it, it it looks actually very similar. So bo both are examples of applications of the H principle, and uh, they both uh, kind of uh, you use ideas of this holonomic approximation theorem. Uh, though holonomic approximation theorem is fairly recent, but they, these are all related. And so if you've seen this uh, video of a version of the sphere, so it looks, it looks similar. It looks similar, but, uh, but it's a little bit easier than with spheres. <laughs> Maybe one of the young students in the audience can do it then. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that, that would be actually even like for the version of the sphere. So, though there is this video, uh, there are many videos, I think, of the version of the sphere, and there are many different versions. It's still not so obvious that uh, those versions are through uh, through immersions. So, there are still kind of uh, a couple of points like the northern pole and the southern pole usually uh, that are kind of under doubt. And so, one actually has to carefully check that this is. This, this is fine. And usually, like, uh, one uses this uh, corrugations of the sphere to do the inversion. And so, for example, the, I remember that there was a question of how many corrugations you need to, to have in order to smoothly inverse uh, the sphere uh, inside out. And so this kind of question is not obvious. It's uh, really, but in this example that I'm showing you here, uh, it's actually, it's much easier to understand. So this, this example is much easier. But it, it is similar. It is similar. So it's, it makes uh, sense to actually make a video for this version. And this would be really helpful to understanding the version of the sphere and other examples. And so here, uh, okay, so uh, now how to, how to prove uh, the H principle of uh, Gromov. So here's the sketch. Uh, and basically, I'm not going to prove in all generality, but kind of the idea is that given a formal solution, right, we need to produce a genuine solution. So we need to show that there is a correspondence between formal solutions and genuine solutions. And so I'm going to show how start from a formal solution and construct a genuine solution. And you can do the same for families and this basically will uh, prove the theorem. So how to do this? So first of all, we start with a manifold M over which the differential relation is given. And then uh, we find an M minus one subcomplex M prime inside of M, such that the manifold M can be uh, deformed uh, into this subcomplex. And uh, we can deform then M by isotopy to a neighborhood of this uh, subcomplex M prime. And then we can use the holonomic approximation theorem to find a solution near the displacement of this complex. Uh, basically, what we do is we just take here just one uh, disk, one cell in this uh, subcomplex, and we just uh, displace it as in holonomic approximation theorem, and we uh, find uh, a solution <coughs> because uh, that holonomic approximation theorem it, um, it kind of it it allows us to find function f such that the function f together with its derivatives is close to the given functions f0, f1, f2, and so on. But our differential relation is open. So it means that if you start with a formal solution, then any close formal solution is also, uh, any close tuple of functions will be also a formal solution. And this way we can see that holonomic approximation theorem indeed gives us uh, a, a solution uh, to the differential relation near this uh, displacement. But then uh, we can just deform M further to the neighborhood of this displacement. <coughs> and if we restrict our solution over the manifold, over the displaced deformed manifold M, then we get a solution to the differential relation. And this is it. So this shows how to start with a formal solution and how to produce a genuine solution. And this is kind of, uh, it, it's a, it kind of explains how to say, for example, do this, this inversion. So here you can imagine that you need to take here first, uh, a, so this manifold is two dimensional. So first of all, we need to take uh, one skeleton, which is 
which is going to be just one circle over here, then you need to make a sign out of that circle and kind of and continue <coughs> continue the argument of the, using holonomic approximation theorem. <coughs> um, so this is all about the H principle, and now I will turn to the B principle. So as I said, B principle is a version of the homotopy principle, uh, but it's uh, a statement not only about uh, one differential relation, but it's about uh, a family of differential relations. So we consider now families of differential relations, Rm. These are coordinate invariant open relations on maps from Rm plus D to Rm. So here's this parameter D. So this is some number. It could be negative. It could be positive. It could be zero, but it's going to be fixed. So I call this D the dimension of the map. Right. So this is a, we consider coordinate invariant differential relations imposed on maps of dimension D. Uh, and then since these are coordinate invariant differential relations, they impose differential relations on uh, maps of arbitrary manifolds of dimension M plus D and M respectively. Uh, a stable relation is a relation so it means that we, we consider this family of relations uh, such that the following condition is true, that if F is a solution to the differential relation R, then this pullback property should be satisfied. <clears throat> uh, namely, uh, so here uh, we have uh, one map from M to N that satisfies uh, this differential relation. And suppose that we have here a map I from another manifold n prime to the manifold n. And suppose that this map i is such that uh, it is transverse to the map f. Then the pullback is going to be a map from some manifold m prime to n prime, right? And so this, <clears throat> uh, this map uh, may or may not satisfy this coordinate invariant differential relation, but uh, we, for a stable differential relation, we require that the pullback, this i star f, so this, this is this map from m prime to n prime, we require that this map satisfies the differential relation. Uh, and <coughs> um, basically, for maps with uh, most of the singularities, this is true. Uh, this is true for immersions, for submersions, for fold maps, for pretty much anything. Uh, and here is a property. Actually, I should say that this is a little bit subtle point, uh, and it's not easy to see for what, uh, like, for example, for maps with what singularities we have this pullback. Uh, but the, th the singularity theory uh, is actually very well developed, and at this point we can actually say for what singularities this is true, and uh, this is true for uh, pretty much all singularities. So this is the answer. And uh, using the pullback, uh, we can uh, prove the following property very easily, that if we have a solution F from the manifold M to N, then the map F cross identity map, so identity is a map from R to R, then this stabilized map is also a solution to the differential relation. And uh, this kind of shows that, for example, that if you have a map, which is a solution, then its trivial homotopy is also a solution to the stable differential relation, which we kind of want if we, we would like to study <coughs> homotopy theory or, uh, of solutions. So examples of stable differential relations are differential relations of coverings. Uh, this, this is the differential relation whose solutions are coverings. Uh, these, these are maps of dimension zero. Uh, we can consider the differential relation of immersions of co-dimension D, and this, are, this again gives us uh, a stable differential relation. Uh, recall that this dimension D or co-dimension D, so this is a fixed number, uh, 
So if we consider emotions of dimension two, for example, so it means that we consider maps from say surfaces to R4, uh, like three dimensional manifolds to five dimensional manifolds and so on. So this core dimension is important uh, and it should be fixed. We can consider a differential relation of subportions of dimension D. <coughs> so again, the dimension of the manifold M is not important. The dimension of the manifold N is not important, but the uh, dimension of the map is important. So this dimension D is how much M is greater than the dimension of D. And then uh, we can consider more generally maps uh, with prescribed singularities. So for maps with prescribed singularities, maps with prescribed singularities uh, correspond to a differential relation. And uh, for almost all uh, prescribed singularities, we get a stable differential relation. Um, so next, uh, why, why do we care about stable mm, relations? Stand. Yes. Can I interrupt you again? Yes, yeah, sure. Are sure, there sure. also examples of stable differential relations involving, let's say, geometric structures or like, I don't know, foliations or contact things or symplectic things and, and such. Right. Yeah. This is this is a good question. So basically, what we want to do is we want to have uh, this. Like for example, uh, so we we basically need just the pullback property, right? And say for example, if you take say foliation. So imagine so that instead of this map F from the manifold M to N, suppose that here on N, you just have a foliation, right? So basically you just, uh, this N is decomposed into this uh, family of uh, submanifolds. So, and then uh, suppose that you have something that maps into N uh, and it's transfers to all these submanifolds. Then of course, uh, the pullback of the foliation is going to be a foliation of N prime and it's going to be of the same co-dimension. And so, uh, <coughs> so kind of foliations is not uh, like not immediately uh, correspond to a differential relation, but the construction still works. So if you have foliation of on N, then you can pull back and you get a foliation on N prime. So the pullback property is true. But uh, of course, for any structure, one has to like specifically uh, check if the structure uh, is well behaved under this pullback property. Yeah, this is a very good question. I see. Uh, maybe then, maybe yeah, maybe just one follow up question, mm -hmm. right? Because for instance, for foliations, people build in this pullback property by considering like half ligger structures and such. Ah, right, right, right. Yeah, it, it is actually very, very closely related. So this is also the uh, H principle. Yeah. So yes. Okay. So the kind of the formal foliation would be a half ligger structure, right? And uh, so, so could you do this in general, like build, like build a stable, build this pullback property into your differential relations by considering half ligger type of right, right, right. So yeah, the, I think that this is a great question. Uh, frankly, I I have not done this and I have not thought about this, but I think that this should be uh, this should be possible, and uh, this might be valuable because you see uh, when you consider this half ligger structures they are uh, kind of complicated. So the classifying, so I'm going to talk about modular spaces, which are like something more precise than uh, classifying spaces. But uh, the, for example, uh, classifying spaces for foliations are extremely complicated. They are like tremendously complicated. And of course, uh, if you can uh, make it sta stable, uh, then many things, I expect that many things should be simplified. And so some new calculations uh, could be could be available. So yeah, I think that this is a great question, yes. Okay, yeah, thanks, that's helpful. Okay, so I, as I said, I have not thought about this much. Uh, and so, <coughs> um, so the question now is why, why do I want this stability, uh, this kind of pullback property? Why this stay, uh, think of being stable is important? And the reason why I would like to consider stable relation is because of uh, this modular space construction. And in fact, this modular space, uh, modular space construction, I've seen the first example uh, that is actually uh, like for foliations. And this construction, it was like long, long, long ago, 
I don't know, it's kind of, it's a really old construction for Phoenicians, but this construction can be, and I'm not sure that it first appeared for Phoenicians. It, it could have appeared for some other structures first. Uh, but uh, this construction, it can be applied in a more general setting. So here's how it is applied. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to consider a discrete set. So this XN, these are just points. So no topology, so this is discrete set. Uh, I mean that this is kind of uh, an obvious topology. So this is just a discrete set. And a point in Xn, just one point in Xn, it corresponds to a submanifold in R infinity cross delta N. So delta N is the simplex of dimension N. This R infinity, it's kind of not so important. I mean that it's very important, but for like, for getting an idea here, this kind of can be ignored if you'd like, because you see <clears throat> our infinity is so big that like mn plus d can be modified in our infinity any way you want. Uh, but the point here is that when you project this submanifold into delta n, uh, this map should be proper. Proper means that uh, the manifold m may not be a compact default, but if it has any, so the, the definition is that the inverse image of compact set is compact. So basically M, all uh, non-compactness of M goes to infinity in R infinity. <clears throat> so the projection should be an R map. So it should be a solution to this given differential relation. And it should be transverse to each phase. Right, of the, of the simplex. So this is the set. So there are, there are many solutions of a differential relation usually. And I just say that each solution it corresponds to a point here in Xn. And now um, the modular space is uh, geometric realization of this simplicial set. Uh, I do not expect that all students know what a realization of the simplicial set is. So I will give an explicit construction. <clears throat> so for each solution f in xn, I take a simplex. And so here, for example, I have this simplex delta n. And here, my kind of on this picture, the differential relations that I consider is the differential relation of immersions of codimension one. So if I have a two dimensional simplex, then uh, an immersion of codimension one, it looks like this uh, red curve. So I have this curve. And then uh, if I may have another simplex, like for example, here's another simplex. Uh, this is a simplex with another solution, uh, which is here immersion of codimension one is just the inclusion of the two points. <coughs> uh, now suppose that we consider a face map. So a face map is just the inclusion of this curve or this uh, simplex uh, as a phase. And suppose that uh, G here is a pullback of F. And you can see that if you map this simplex over here, then kind of this solution, it kind of agrees with the solution here over the phase. So it means that G is a pullback of F. So since they agree, what I do is I just identify them. So I, I identify this simplex with the uh, phase. And this solution G, these two points, is just the restriction of F to this, uh, to this phase. <coughs> but of course, uh, this simplex uh, should be identified with phases of some other simplices. For example, here we have another solution, say H. And over here, we have this simplex identified with this phase. And if you identify this simplex with this phase, and if I did, you identify this simplex with this phase, then together they produce something like this. And the solution now will be producing something, something like this. Okay. And now what we do is we take actually all possible simplices in all these XNs, and we do all these identifications, and we get a huge space. And this is a modular space of solutions. So the modular space of solutions, it has homotopy type of the classifying space, as I will explain in a second. And in particular, for example, <coughs> if you differential relation, 
say, submersions of dimension D, then it means that this modular space, which is a topological space, is uh, of homotopy type of this disjoint union of B diff uh, of manifolds of dimension D. So this is kind of is, is a nice construction for, for this space. Okay. So this is an important construction for modular space of solutions. Uh, and uh, the reason why modular spaces are important is because of this, say, universal property. So suppose that we have a stable differential relation uh, and now take uh, a proper solution uh, of this differential relation. So this is a solution. So this M is mapped to N. And now the claim is that whenever you have a solution F, you get uh, a classifying map U sub F to, the, to this modular space. So this modular space, it serves as a classifying space. So this uh, kind of, you may have seen this for, for example, vector bundles, classifying spaces of vector bundles, or classifying spaces of other structures. So say, for example, for vector bundles, whenever you have a vector bundle over the manifold N, then you have a map from N to the classifying space that pulls back the vector bundle. And here it is something similar, but for, for maps. So we have this classifying space for, uh, for solutions to differential relation. So whenever you have a map this, uh, into this classifying space, you pull back a solution. And the other way around, if you have a, a solution, you map it to the classifying space. So you have a, an essentially unique, uh, at least up to homotopy map that pulls back <coughs> uh, to, uh, to the given solution. Um, so the modal space is a little bit more than the classifying space because uh, in some setting, this universal map UF is just unique, not only up to homotopy, but it is unique. <coughs> so now let me, uh, let me kind of show how to construct this classifying map. So we are given this map F from a manifold M to N. And so first of all, uh, we can lift this map F to uh, an embedding. So kind of one component from M to N. So this is just the map F. And another component from M to R infinity is just some <coughs> uh, general position map. So it's going to be an embedding. And so we have this embedding. Then we get uh, a triangulation of N. So we just uh, split N into simplices. And we can choose this triangulation so that this triangulation is actually uh, transverse to the manifold, to the map F. And then we can just look at any of these simplices and we can look at the solution F only over the, this simplex. And then if you have this simplex with a solution, then we know that there is a copy of such a simplex with a solution in this modular space because modular space, remember, it just consists of all possible simplices with solutions. And so, of course, this simplex maps to a simplex in this modular space. And this way, you get this uh, classifying map. So, this universal prop this, so we have this universal property. Uh, in particular, we can define the characteristic classes of solutions and we can um, use modular spaces to calculate these characteristic classes. So what is the characteristic class? So a characteristic class of a differential relation is a function that associates with each solution a cohomology class in the base, in the manifold N. So whenever you have a solution, so there is a cohomology class in N that somehow characterizes uh, this solution. And the requirement is that uh, this characteristic class should satisfy the pullback property. So whenever we have a map I uh, to N transverse to F, we can form another solution. And uh, the characteristic class of the new solution should be just the pullback of the characteristic class of the old solution. So this is a pullback property for characteristic classes. You may have seen characteristic classes, say, for example, for vector bundles. And these are very similar, but for, uh, for solutions to differential relations. And an important property is that characteristic classes of a given differential relation are in bijective correspondence 
with cohomology classes of the modular space. So if we calculate <coughs> here uh, in this modular space, uh, cohomology, all cohomology classes, all cohomology groups, then we get all characteristic classes of the uh, of solutions to differential relation. <coughs> and um, in general, there are very many differential relations, of course. Uh, for some differential relations, these characteristic classes have been computed. But for most of the differential relations, uh, characteristic classes still unknown. Um, so now, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, Alvaro, I'm, I'm not sure when we should uh, make a break. So it's um, so up to you. So whenever you think it's a good uh, cutting point, we can uh, stop. Uh, normally, we would stop in five minutes, maybe. Okay, okay, okay. But, but it's up to you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, now formulate the B principle and <clears throat> or, or motivate it, and then maybe yeah, we'll have a break. Uh, so, oh, actually, Albert, I think that it's kind of so. I think that I would make a stop over here if it's if it's possible. So, and then, then I would continue just from here because, yeah, this, this would be that the most natural good. break. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay.